And joining us now in the studio to discuss the situation in Syria and the surprising prospect of peace talks in Afghanistan with the Taliban, we have Anatole Levin, the Chair of International Relations in the War Studies Department at King's College in London. He's also the author of Pakistan, A Hard Country. While in Australia, he'll be appearing at the University of Sydney's US Studies Centre at the Lowy Institute. Thanks for being here. Hello. Um, what do you make of these sinister YouTube videos showing these massacres in Aleppo? I'm afraid it's pretty much what's to be expected under the circumstances. Clearly this is turning into a kind of ethno-religious civil war. Uh, terrible atrocities have been committed by government supporters. It's going to happen that there will be atrocities by the other side as well. Uh, of course, the threat out of all this, perhaps not even a threat, perhaps something like a certainty, uh, is that if the opposition wins, the Alawite minority, which supports the government, which is the government, in fact, and many of the Christians, will in fact be killed or driven out of Syria. I'm afraid that's the way things are going. How long can the West continue to support fighters who are openly posting their war crimes on YouTube? Well, it's certainly an embarrassment, but you know... It's a bit the... more than that, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's not just an embarrassment if we're secretly going to be supplying them with arms, weapons, advice and CIA protection. Well, you know, the West has quite a record of being able to turn a blind eye to this kind of thing uh, if it feels the need to do so. I mean, remember what the cost of a Liberation Army got up to, you know, and some of the other forces that we've supported over the years. I think a bigger question is just how much the West actually wants to support the opposition, because, of course, there are, there are great fears in the West uh, about some of the forces present in the Syrian opposition and their links to al-Qaeda, their potential links to al-Qaeda, for example. That, I think, is a, is a bigger problem. But then again, that can also lead Western governments actually to try to support the Syrian opposition in an effort to get some influence over them, precisely in order to counter the extremists. Yes, one of the obvious points to make is that uh, when you see the raw footage uh, posted on YouTube, um, the executioners seem to whip themselves up into a kind of almost religious frenzy with repeated chants of Allah, al -Akbar. And um, it, it does seem there's a possibility there that we are seeing the influence of jihadis in the battlefield already. I mean, I wouldn't read too much into these particular cries because all the sides in Middle Eastern conflicts shout Allahu Akbar. It's a kind of universal thing. But there have been credible reports of al-Qaeda trying to infiltrate this war. And the reason I say they're credible is that this is very much al-Qaeda's modus operandi. You know, it's how they got into Afghanistan, it's how they got into Chechnya, it's how they got into Libya. There's a, a national liberation struggle of some kind, which begins for other reasons, or largely other reasons, for local political or ethnic reasons. Uh, but once a civil war or a rebellion has started, uh, al-Qaeda fighters or members of groups close to al-Qaeda can go in there and through their courage, it must be said, through their discipline, through their ideological rigour, through their determination, they can gain an influence out of all proportion to their numbers. And we have seen that before, and as I say, that is very much, that has been very much part of their strategy. Iraq, of course, was the biggest example of all. Sure, and the al-Qaeda leadership, Ayman al-Zawahiri, for example, has been calling on jihadis to, to go to Syria to make this the new front, the new resistance fight. And, and of course, they do have this pattern, too, of posting gruesome videos as kind of tools, recruitment tools. And so I guess that's why this particular series of events looks so sinister. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, you know, we know that Saudi Arabia is backing the Syrian opposition. And Saudi Arabia has a certain history of encouraging, you know, of discouraging radicalism at home, but encouraging its radicals to go abroad to fight other regimes. And there has been a pattern over the years, starting with Afghanistan in the 1980s, that where a lot of Saudi money goes, extremism tends to follow. Yes, there is a strange sort of axis emerging in, in that regard. I mean, Saudi Arabia, Qatar... Turkey and the United States, and even reports of a, of a base right next to a, an American air base 60 uh, kilometres or so uh, on the Turkish side of the Syrian border. So um, I'm, I'm wondering what is actually going on there. Is this an attempt by these countries to sort of take away the influence that, or, or 
somehow reduce the influence that Iran has in the region? I think that's a big part of it. A lot of this is about hostility to Iran rather than hostility to Assad. But it must be said that the Assad regime over the years has also made itself very widely disliked in the region as well as among its own people. OK, what do you make of this uh, news from Washington and, uh, and the, the hints uh, from the British Foreign Secretary that, uh, uh, that there will be an upscaling, if you like, of the support uh, to the rebel forces, to the free Syrian army through covert uh, uh, US forces in particular, and in the case of Obama having perhaps signed an intelligence order to do this? Well, as I understand, that's actually started already. This sort of formalises it, and it's, it's also a way of... of, of suggesting that Western governments, you know, are not simply standing by and doing nothing. Uh, how much effect it will have, I don't know. Um, I think that it is in part, as I say, actually an attempt to counter extremism in the Syrian opposition. But I would doubt that the kind of intelligence aid that we will give uh, will be enough to, co to counteract the much more substantial aid being given by Saudi, for example. Well, indeed, the Saudis and the Qataris seem to be in the business of supplying weapons, um, yes. which is more to the point, I suppose. Um, while uh, jihadi fighters are looking to the Syrian civil war as a new front, uh, some of the more traditional allies of al-Qaeda seem to be having second thoughts. Now, you recently met some former senior Taliban figures um, in, in the Emirates. Uh, can you tell us uh, what you concluded from those meetings? Well, these are former leaders, and, but also people who've negotiated very closely with the Taliban and who've been very close to them over the years. They all suggested that the Taliban in private are much more amenable uh, to the idea of a deal with the Americans, of course, a deal on their terms than has been thought so far, uh, that they are, in fact, willing to break with al-Qaeda and to exclude them from areas of Afghanistan under their control, and even that they would be willing for a certain space of time to allow a continuation of American bases and military advisers in Afghanistan. And that is the most extraordinary uh, concession of all. I mean, they have been talking about the Americans as invaders. The idea that any of them could remain under some sort of Taliban auspices inside the country seems bizarre. If true, this, this really would be striking. I must say it surprised me. Mm. What our interlocutors said was that the Taliban don't want Afghanistan to disintegrate again uh, into you know, a, a civil war with endless warlords. They want a united, centralised Afghanistan, with themselves, of course, having a big share of central power. So are they considering the American forces as kind of mediators in, in that regard, or uh, some sort of buffer between the main groups? Is that what they're thinking? Not, well, perhaps in part, but I think above all, they, they want the Americans to help to keep the Afghan National Army together so that you don't get generals going off and setting up separate kingdoms you know, in different parts of Afghanistan. That would, I think, be a very major part of their motive. But it must be stressed, of course, we know that there are very considerable divisions within the Taliban. Uh, it wasn't at all clear. That all the people we talked to said that in the end, if Mullah Omar gave an order all the Taliban fighters would fall into line. Yes, we should explain uh, to those who perhaps have forgotten who he is, a spiritual leader mm -hmm. of the Taliban. And, uh, I mean, well, two things. Where is he? <laughs> and secondly, uh, what does he think about all of this? Well, he's in Pakistan, and we don't really know what he thinks about all of this. Yeah. Do we he's, know where he is in Pakistan? Mm, he's in northern Baluchistan. Um, if, well, I don't know. <laughs> Somewhere. Yeah. Uh, his official spokesman has denied all this, but, of course, that's to be predicted, because... Another thing that all the people we talked to said was that the Taliban will give up nothing in advance. Every single thing will have to be agreed as part of a settlement and in return for a quid pro quo from the Americans. Uh, the other thing they all said was that the Taliban will not negotiate with the Karzai administration. They'll negotiate with other groups in Afghanistan, uh, other nationalities, for example, who they regard as more or less permanent forces, but they won't negotiate with Karzai. Well, tell me this. Did you regard this as a kind of back-channel um, information uh, to sort of get going uh, this kind of idea so the Americans would think seriously about negotiating with the Taliban? I mean, is that what was going on here when these people chose to speak to you and it must be said to other journalists as well? Yes. Yes, I think that's, that's what it is. Um, 
there are important groups within the Taliban uh, who do want to, to get a deal. They don't think that they can win an outright military victory um, against the opposition of other nationalities in Afghanistan, backed by the Indians and the Russians, for example. They don't want to be too dependent on Pakistan. Contrary to a lot of the impression given in the West, they hate the Pakistanis uh, for the way they've treated them over the years. And also they fear the Pakistanis turning them into a, you know, a, a dependency. Uh, so there are these groups which would like a deal with the Americans if, of course, they can get it on their terms. Well, the, but the other side of the equation, of course, is the Americans' terms and the, the terms mm -hmm. of the West, because uh, there are certain non-negotiable elements, you'd have to say. I mean, the role of women, uh, the role of education, the role of women in politics and in society um, would be non-negotiable, I would imagine. Yes. Now, on that, the, the people we talked to said... The Taliban will, will accept um, women's education as long as it's separate, even after puberty. Um, they'll accept university education for women, but it has to be separate. They will not accept co-education, for example. They won't accept men and women working closely together. Uh, they, but that's pretty problematic, isn't it? Well, uh, when, I mean, obviously the... The, the experiment here was to actually put women into positions of power uh, in, alongside men, even in government. But, you know, one thing that does have to be recognised is it's pretty unlikely that that will continue after we leave in any case, because if you look at what the Karzai government has been doing, you know, if you look at the actual behaviour of many members of that government and its, its backers, most unfortunately, you know, so many of these political achievements of women at the highest level are purely the result of Western pressure. They don't come from Afghan sources at all. So whether actually in the long run much of this would survive, you know, even if we had a non-Taliban government in place, seems to me pretty problematical. That's rather grim. But a final question. What would happen? You've just mentioned the Karzai regime. What would happen to the Karzai clan uh, if some kind of deal was struck? Would they have to depart the country? Yes. I think that's the answer. Something to say on that score, though, is uh, that the bulk of the Obama administration is dead against Karzai trying to put one of his own clan in to succeed him at, uh, in 2014 um, because they're so disgusted with the behaviour of that government over the years. So curiously, on that at least, there might be a certain community of, uh, of interest between the Americans and the Taliban. A tiny glimpse of light at the end of the tunnel, a very tiny one. Anatole Levin, we thank you very much for uh, coming to talk to us tonight. Thank you.